Hello, this is Brian Auten of Apologetics 315. Today's interview is with apologist Norman Geisler. Dr. Geisler is the author or co-author of some 70 books and hundreds of articles. He's taught theology, philosophy, and apologetics on the college or graduate level for 50 years. He has spoken or debated in some 26 countries on six continents. He has a BA, MA, THB, and PhD in philosophy, and he's taught at seminaries in the United States, including Trinity Evangelical and Dallas Seminary. Currently, he's the Distinguished Professor of Apologetics at Veritas Evangelical Seminary in Marietta, California. The purpose of this interview is to learn more from Dr. Geisler's experience as a defender of the faith. Thanks for joining me today, Dr. Geisler. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, first off, I want to acknowledge the impact that you've had on so many in the area of defending the faith. And your years of faithfulness in this area, I'm sure, has influenced many people to both understand the faith more and and learn how to defend it. So thank you. Well, you're welcome. It's a privilege to serve. Well, Dr. Geisler, you've been teaching in the area of theology and philosophy and apologetics for like over 50 years. So what got you into this field? Witnessing evangelism, the people who led me to the Lord took me out the next day, uh, cold turkey, uh, door-to-door calling. The next night was street meetings, cold turkey. Uh, Wednesday was prayer meeting. Thursday was jail service. Friday was city rescue mission. Saturday was Youth for Christ rally, and Sunday was church. I didn't know you could backslide. I just thought you had to serve the Lord all the time. Problem was, I didn't know much. It was on-the-job training, but I didn't have uh, much training to begin with, like zero. A few weeks after I was saved, I was uh, already tied up in knots by Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, and a drunk staggered up to me in the ghetto in Detroit and said, you're not supposed to be doing this. Grabbed the Bible out of my hand. He said, I'm a graduate of Moody Insta Bible Toot. Uh, And uh, he took the Bible out of my hands and said, read this, pointed right to the passage in the Gospel. In red letters, Jesus said, go and tell no man. He said, now get out of here. Jesus doesn't want you to do this. I had no idea what that meant. But uh, due to my series of... uh, being tied up in knots, I had to make a decision. Either I'm going to have to stop witnessing or I'm going to have to start getting answers. And I chose the latter and dedicated my life to doing the same. Well, excellent. It's the same way I got into apologetics was evangelism, running into tough questions, and then finding one of your books. So (laughs) thanks for writing your apologetics books because they were some of the first influences Now, I'm curious to know what authors or apologists or theologians were the greatest influences on your own thinking and development. Well, to start with, we had none. Uh, There weren't even any C.S. Lewis books in those uh, days. Uh, And so this is uh, 1950 I'm talking about, Mm -hmm. uh, 61 years ago. And I had nothing to go, go by. I had a few teachers at the Bible College who uh, had some interest in apologetics that were early influence on my life, life like Dr. Shaw, who spent 20 years as a missionary and knew Arabic and uh, knew the archaeology of the land. That was very influential. I had a a professor who taught apologetics, uh, later became uh, chaplain at uh, uh, Wheaton College, who was an influence. Uh, on my life. And then later when I went to uh, Wheaton College, I I had Dr. Kenneth Conser, Harvard PhD, uh, uh, and a a great uh, scholar who influenced uh, my life. But most of all, historically, I was influenced by uh, St. Augustine um, and Anselm and particularly Thomas Aquinas. I call AAA theism, AAA, 400 A.D., about 1,000 A.D. and about 1,200, and uh, their influence on my life, particularly Summa Logica, I saw the brilliance uh, of the apologetic mind at work. I was immediately attracted to, uh, to it and uh, have, have been a, a student ever since. Well, as we were talking about the changing landscape of apologetics, for instance, what books are available to us and and things over the past 
number of decades. H- how have you seen that landscape go from having, as you say, no C.S. Lewis books to now there being a lot of resources? It went from zero in 1950, the year I was saved, uh, to uh, what we have today, which is uh, overwhelming when you think of it. Uh, there were no apologetics books written by an uh, American contemporary apologist uh, until later that year and uh, come out, came out, I think, uh, uh, or early next year, John Carnell's book on uh, Christian apologetics uh, came out. So I went from zero. Uh, only thing is C.S. Lewis that was even heard of back in the 50s was the Narnia, uh, Narnia series and um, Later, of course, the books of uh, C.S. Lewis were great influence, the books of Francis Schaeffer, whom I knew personally and, and worked with on a couple of occasions, uh, were an influence. Had it not been for C.S. Lewis and Francis Schaeffer, practically nobody uh, back then, the 50s and 60s and even 70s, would have gotten into apologetics. Hmm. Well, you did mention Augustine and Anselm and Aquinas uh, being strong influences and, uh, of course, classics. When you speak to your students, are there any books that you would just almost make required reading for them uh, if they're in this field? Everything Lewis wrote on the topic uh, is uh, necessary. He's the greatest apologist of the 20th century. His influence is still unabated in the 21st uh, century now. Uh, Of course, mere Christianity, the problem of... uh, uh, pain, miracles, God in the dark, Christian reflections, the great uh, divorce, the abolition of man, uh, just for starters. Now, have you seen any sort of changing trends in the questions that skeptics or unbelievers would ask since beginning in apologetics and versus, you know, questions that you would hear today? Well, overall, uh, no, same, same old questions, so that... Uh, uh, if you have answers to them, they're kind of time-worn uh, questions, and the list hasn't changed uh, much. The emphasis, the the big difference today in the uh, new atheist over the old atheist is that, that they stress uh, the problem of evil more, and they stress that uh, Christianity is the source of all evils in society and uh, all wars and man's inhumanity demands. So other than uh, the shift of emphasis, it's the uh, same thing, same arguments against God, uh, same problem of evil eliminates God in, in their view, and uh, we don't have uh, uh, any substantial uh, evidence that uh, God existed or that Christianity is true. In your studies and going through all these difficult questions and, you know, if you will, assaults on Christianity, did you ever have any doubts yourself, or did you ever hesitate in your faith and, and wonder, boy, I'm not really sure? Uh, nothing major. Um, minor uh, doubts pass through uh, one's mind, but uh, I never uh, had any problem with doubt. Doubt is something that I've constantly doubted. Uh, mm-hmm. And if you doubt your doubts, if you're agnostic about agnosticism, uh, you won't have any problem. It's people who become certain in their doubts and, and sure in their agnosticism that have problems, which is self-defeating, of course. Kind of one of the reasons reasons I ask that is because I hear sometimes when people start, uh, say, studying the arguments from atheists or uh, different religions or something, they they might go through crises of their own faith and begin to wonder, boy, you know, the other side's case sounds pretty good. Would you have any sort of advice for how one should study, you know, contrary arguments? My uh, philosophy teacher in Bible college uh, back in the 50s used to say, the next best thing besides godliness is logic. And my suggestion to them is study logic, learn how to analyze arguments, uh, learn how to analyze fallacies. Uh, and once you learn how to do that, uh, you won't fear uh, atheists and agnostics because there's always some flaw in the argument. And the better and the more astute you are in the logic, the quicker you'll be able to see it. Good, good. 
Well, I wonder if you've seen any positive growth as well in apologetics happening in the local church and, and how you'd recommend maybe people step out to make apologetics a greater part of their local ministries. It's encouraging to see uh, the interest in apologetics uh, today. Uh, I remember going from uh, zero, and no, no books, uh, 1950, to uh, what we have today, hundreds if not thousands of uh, books and hundreds of uh, Christian apologists, uh, many with PhDs, and um, we started the Evangelical Philosophical Society way back in the uh, 70s, and that's booming. More recently, we started the International Society of Christian Apologetics, and uh, that's just getting uh, off the ground. We have numerous organizations, numerous scholars, uh, uh, books, resources, colleges, seminaries that are adding apologetic majors, and even the, what were normally called the countercult or discernment ministries, they're calling themselves apologetics ministries. I do apologetic seminars, uh, you know, practically 40 weekends a year all over the uh, uh, country. Uh, it's really encouraging to see how people are becoming armed uh, for their uh, faith and uh, becoming trained uh, in doing what the Bible commands us to do, which is to give a reason for the hope that's in us, First Peter 3.15. Well, we've got all of these different sorts of little fires starting up all over the nation and all over the world, and I wonder what you'd say to someone who they don't have a fire going at, at their own home church, and they say, boy, I really wish we could, you know, equip our people better, and you know, what would be the first steps that you'd have them take to sort of kindle that? Uh, go to my website, uh, normgeisler.com, and uh, there's all kinds of uh, resources there, and there's an article there. There are free uh, articles. On, uh, click on articles and read the one on an apologetic for apologetics, uh, and then uh, get stirred up as to why it's needed. Uh, then go back to... Uh, uh, your pastor and your leaders in the church and encourage them to uh, put in some apologetics into the Sunday school or have a special series on apologetics or invite outside speakers. That's what uh, I do all the time all over the country to come in and do a series on apologetics to stir up the uh, people. I, was in, I live near the Billy Graham Center in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I noticed in his yearbook uh, it said his favorite verse was, Contend for the Faith, uh, Jude uh, 3. And we, we need to do it, uh, Colossians 4, uh, 6 says, uh, Let your speech be always uh, with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. So they just need to become aware. Hosea said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And once they get the knowledge of uh, what the Bible commands, <clears throat> there are four reasons basically for doing apologetics. The Bible commands it, uh, reason demands it, uh, our, our culture uh, expects it, and results confirm it. Well, excellent. Now, I know that many of our listeners are those people who are interested in getting equipped and involved in apologetics in different ways, so I want to ask you a series of different things that uh, perhaps will help them to become better a defender. So we talked about different books that maybe apologists would be reading, maybe required reading and, and things like that. But what sort of topics do you think are, are the most valuable that maybe they would you know, really need to focus on? It all boils down to three issues today that we're fighting. Pluralism, relativism, and naturalism. Uh, pluralism says that <clears throat> all religions are, are true. That's deadly to Christianity, which claims to be the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me, John 14:6. 6. Uh, relativism, uh, your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth. That's deadly to Christianity because it claims to have the absolute truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And naturalism, there are no miracles, and of course if there are no acts of God, there's no God who can act. So God's existence and miracles, all under naturalism, the absolute nature of truth, and the exclusive nature of truth that whatever is true, the opposite is false, are our three enemies. Hmm. Now, as far as skills that you think apologists should have or develop, speaking skills comes to mind, but what would you recommend? Well, first of all, uh, 
not only do you need the basic uh, uh, intelligence, which I'll assume everyone who's interested uh, has, but you need to use it to study to show yourself approved unto God. Um, the late Dr. Barnhouse said that if I had 30 years to live, I'd study 20 and preach 10. Most of us would study three at the most and preach 27. Uh, and you can tell when you listen to us. My pastor used to say, an empty barrel makes more noise than a full one. Uh, we need to study the source half approved unto God. Uh, start in your own home. Uh, uh, get our apologetics uh, course. Uh, just look on our uh, on our uh, website, normgeiser.com, and get the uh, get the apologetics course, the lay in student. You can get a certificate taking basic courses. If you want to go uh, further? We have an extension uh, course from Veritas Evangelical Seminary where I teach in California, where you can do the whole thing. We DVD'd all of the uh, classes, and you can take it right from your own home and get a degree in apologetics, but get trained. Don't go out there uh, with uh, no training. That'd be like uh, sending a soldier into battle with no training, no guns, no uniform. Uh, it's going to be fatal. Now, a lot of people are get involved being ill-equipped, as you say there. What sort of pitfalls would you want to warn Christian fenders against? Well, don't think you're going to convert the world uh, overnight, and don't think you're going to convert everyone. Our job is not to bring everyone to Christ, it's to bring Christ to everyone. And our job isn't to uh, uh, convert everyone. Only the Holy Spirit can convert him. Our job is to lead the horse to the water, um, and only the Holy Spirit can make him drink. But we have to convince uh, the horse that there is water, that it's good water, and that one ought to drink it, and that's where evidence comes uh, in. So our job is to uh, present the evidence, and you're probably going to have three alternatives, just like the Apostle Paul did, three results. Some believe, some mock, and some say, I'll hear you again. And uh, if you can uh, have that kind of success, uh, consider it uh, very successful. I'm thinking about the idea of being well-rounded in one's studies and one's manner of approaching the subject of apologetics. I wonder if you would say that there are particular areas that might be underdeveloped and should be strengthened uh, as you sort of survey the landscape. Of course, the best thing you can study is uh, philosophy because everything boils down in the final analysis to a philosophical problem or an objection, no matter whether it's coming from science because it's philosophy of science or history because it's philosophy of history at the root of it. Uh, so study philosophy, um, get well trained, uh, learn. You can't learn anything that uh, God uh, can't use because uh, different people come from different angles and the more you know, uh, the more people you can uh, reach, but particularly uh, philosophy and then of course uh, uh, history because that's where the real world is and was and the history of everything is there including uh, the Bible uh, and uh, literature because that's where you learn the great expressions of, uh, of uh, truth. So become fully equipped, fully trained, uh, get the armor of God on and then uh, face the enemy. Well, what role do you think that theology plays in one's studies and overall grounding? Well, apologetics is defending the faith, and you can't defend the faith unless you know what the faith is. And theology is absolutely necessary to know what the faith is. Uh, theology tells us what to believe. Apologetics tells us why we believe it. So you have to study theology. That's why we wrote the book Conviction Without Compromise. It has the 14 basic fundamental doctrines. You need to know what they are. Uh, what the Bible teaches about them, how to defend uh, them, because sooner or later you're going to be called upon to uh, defend what you believe. If you want to get somebody converted to Christianity, they're going to want to know what uh, they're uh, jumping into. They don't want to leap before they look, and no rational person does that, so you want to make sure that you're well equipped in theology because they have a twisted theology of some kind. Everybody has a theology. The question is whether it's good or bad, whether it's formal or informal, they have one. And uh, we need a good one and a formal one and be able to articulate it.
Just a moment ago, you were mentioning the three areas of relativism, pluralism, and uh, naturalism. And I'm wondering uh, if that's what you see, things that come against Christianity falling into those categories, or do you see maybe on the horizon any other sorts of things that might be potential enemies of the gospel? Those are pretty well all-encompassing categories. Most everything else is a subdivision of mm -hmm. it. If you uh, look at all the problems and in the philosophy that Christians have to face, it really boils down to defending relativism, relativism in meaning, relativism in truth, relativism in morals, but relativism is a deadly enemy. And then, of course, uh, you have to defend uh, exclusivism, that the opposite of true is false. We live in a world where people think that you can hold the opposing views and they can both be true. And Opposites can't be true. Either there's milk in the refrigerator or there's not. Can't both be milk and not milk at the same time in the same sense. So pluralism, relativism, and naturalism, almost all the, sci the sciences. So what's the debate in creation versus evolution? It's naturalism versus supernaturalism. They've ruled out the supernatural and then uh, say to us that uh, evolution must be a fact. Why? Because they've already ruled out the only major alternative, namely a supernatural act. So those are the three issues, and we've got to get trained in them and every important subdivision of them. Mm -hmm. One thing that uh, you've done in a number of your books is sort of outline various arguments for the existence of God. So I'm wondering what you believe to be the strongest evidence that God exists well, uh, the uh, strongest argument, I think, is the cosmological argument. The strongest form of it, I think, is what's called the vertical form of the cosmological argument, that uh, uh, something exists, nothing cannot cause something, therefore something must eternally and necessarily exist. Even Jonathan Edwards, when he was a teenager, had devised an argument uh, follows that form. I've seen people converted on the spot within minutes uh, because you can't deny you exist uh, if you say I don't exist you have to exist in order to say it so your own existence is undeniable but if something exists and nothing can't cause something then something must have always existed eternal and must necessarily have existed because if it didn't uh, necessarily exist then there wouldn't be grounds for anything else that exists I found that to be the most uh, powerful and convincing argument. Now, in your debates, you, you know, with skeptics and atheists over the years, I also wonder what skeptic or non-believer you may have learned the most from. Well, I learned a lot from all skeptics. I tell my students that you know, I spend most of my time studying and teaching what I don't believe, namely the history of philosophy, and I'm writing a book on it now, a history of philosophy from a Christian point of view. Uh, you have to have a knowledge of what's going on. That's the bread and butter. That's the standing on the shoulder of giants. As someone said, you can learn more from the error of a great mind than you can the truths of a small mind. Because uh, the error of a great mind is a significant error, and you learn a lot from significant errors. Furthermore, I would encourage reading uh, atheists, because when I see uh, the fallacies, the flimsy grounds upon which they base their belief it encourages me in my own faith so i don't read streams in the uh, desert or daily bread for devotion i read atheists because uh, they're encouraging nietzsche and freud and Fromm and feuerbach and uh schopenhauer and all of the great uh atheists because as i read them i um, strengthen my own faith i see how to answer the fallacies in in their uh, uh writings and uh, i'm able to uh, do what the Bible tells me, to destroy arguments and every proud obstacle against the knowledge of God and bring every thought captive to Christ, Second Corinthians 10.5. Well, uh, as you're mentioning devotions there and <laughs> reading atheist literature, I find that kind of amusing. Uh, but at the same time, on, on a deeper note, I wonder... You know, when we're talking about devotions for someone who is really, you know, obviously all Christians should be, have a devotional life and, uh, and a walk with the Lord that they seek to have fervent. I wonder what you would say to encourage Christian apologists to keep that walk with the Lord 
close and fervent and talk to them about their prayer life. Keep in the word and let the word uh, keep in you. Abide in the word and let the word abide in you. Uh, every day I start the day off with prayer. I fall on my knees uh, out of my bed and pray and give my life to God for that day. Then I head as fast as I can to my office and read through the Bible, chapter after chapter after chapter. And then when I'm through with that, I start over again and read it again. I keep getting more and more like a snowball going down a hill. You have to have prayer to speak to God. You have to read the Bible. God speaks to you. You have to share your faith with uh, others, and you have to learn from others. Uh, if to study the great uh, apologists and thinkers and missionaries uh, uh, of the uh, Christian world, in order for you to grow. There are four ways to grow, and it's like a four-legged stool. If you only have all four legs, it's not going to be very stable. Uh, God talks to you. You talk to God. That's prayer and a Bible reading. You talk to others. That's witnessing and teaching. Others talk to you. They share their testimony and their truth with you, and you grow. You know, we talked about different arguments that we might use in seeking to overcome objections or maybe... Uh, seek to win people over to believing that Christianity is true. I wonder how you would encourage people to develop a strong character and a life of integrity that would speak to that as well. Well, you have to not only read the Word, but practice it. James uh, said, don't look at yourself in the mirror and go away and forget what manner of man you are. Be doers of the Word, not hearers only. It's one thing to read it, another thing to apply it. Uh, to your life. So what you read in the morning, take opportunity to apply uh, during the day. And if you do that, uh, you'll grow because uh, Peter says, grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ by desiring the milk of the word. And then later, as Hebrews 5 says, the meat of the word. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, someone had asked me, uh, they found out that I'd be interviewing you, and they said, well, they would want to hear from you about some of the illustrations that you use. As anyone who has listened to your talks quickly find out you have various illustrations that you use to uh, get various ideas across. So I wonder if you have one or two favorite or best ones that you typically use. One I used in debates for years with atheists uh, was one I took from... Uh, Richard Taylor's uh, book on uh, metaphysics and uh, adopted it um, and changed it a little bit. If atheists and atheists went for a walk in the woods and they saw a glass ball eight foot in diameter and said, where did this come from? The atheist said, I don't know, but something must have cost it. And the uh, Christian said, well, what if it were 16 feet in diameter? Would it still need a cause? And the atheist said, yeah, of course, if little balls need a cause, bigger ones need a cause. He said, well, what if it was 8,000 miles in diameter and 25,000 miles around? Would it still need a cause? The atheist paused and said, mm, yeah, if the little balls need causes and bigger ones need causes and really, really big balls need causes too. Then the Christian said to the atheist, what if we make the ball as big as the whole universe? Will it still need a cause? The atheist snapped back, of course not. The universe is just there. Uh, everybody gets the point. Uh, enlarging the size doesn't diminish the need for a cause. It increases it. Okay. Do you have another? Well, I have a lot of them on uh, different <laughs> topics, but that one just had to be on the uh, existence, of, uh, existence of God. So they're just numerous illustrations. Uh, let's throw a humorous one in uh, just for uh, the audience. People laugh at miracles. Skeptics laugh at miracles. And I talk about the uh, the uh, girl who was standing the sidewalk with her Bible witnessing, and the skeptic came by and said, you don't believe that, do you? And she said, yeah, I believe it. And she, he said, well, it can't be true. Science has disproven parts of the Bible. And she said, like what? And he said, well, like like Jonah and the uh, whale. You can't live for three days and three nights in the belly of a, a big fish that would the gastronomical juice of the stomach would eat you up. There'd be no air to breathe. And she said, if you're talking about Joan, I believe it's true. And a skeptic laughed and said, well, how do you know it's true? And um, she said, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Joan if it's true. And he laughed and said, well, what if Joan is not in heaven? She said, then you ask him. <laughs> very good, very good. Speaking again to those people who are uh, 
uh, they're looking at their studies and they found the area of apologetics and their heart is to pursue that further. So, you know, how, how would you recommend they go deeper in that area? Some people would want to seek a degree of one kind or another. So what are your recommendations to people who come up to you, say, after a talk and say, uh, Dr. Geisler, what's the next step? Well, start uh, at a basic level. Uh, get our book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, because that covers the whole waterfront in one book, and, and read it and uh, be challenged and inspired by a lot of atheists, agnostics, have been saved reading it. Then if you want to go a little uh, further, then get our series uh, on uh, apologetics. Get our DVDs, uh, 12 Points to Prove Christianity is True, and uh, listen to them. And if you want to go a little deeper, then uh, 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 take uh, a course, uh, take our Lay Institute course on apologetics you can get it right on the uh, internet from our uh, website normgeisler.com and take that and uh, get the certificate now if you really want to get serious and get an academic uh, degree then you need to go to veritas evangelical seminary uh, which is veritasseminary.com and sign up all of our courses uh, are on dvd and we have the top apologists in every area of apologetics in the United States, the top guy in world religions, Wynne Cordwin, the top guy in historical apologetics, uh, Gary Habermas. We have the top people in archaeology, like Professor uh, Collins. We have the top people in, you name it, every area in cults, around roads, and study under the best because it's all taped. The class is the next best thing besides being there because you can hear the lecture, see the students, listen to the questions, and then you can um, email your question in and get an answer uh, as well. But you cannot possibly go to battle if you're not equipped. Um, an old man and a young man were out in the harvest field harvesting wheat with their sickle. There was a little cloud in the sky. And as the day wore on, the cloud became larger and larger, and the old man sat down and started to sharpen his sickle. The young man said to him, what are you doing? See that cloud? The storm is coming. Don't waste your time sitting there sharpening your sickle. Let's uh, get the job done. And the young man looked at him and said, he who stops to sharpen his sickle wastes no time. And I would say the best thing you can do for yourself is sharpen your sickle. Uh, get educated, get informed, uh, get trained, and then you'll be equipped to go into the harvest field. Well, I love that quote, by the way. Uh, I know some people are wondering, boy, am I too old to seek a degree? What are your thoughts on, you know, different walks of life people might be in and uh, how that might may or may not be for them? Moses was 80 before he was fully trained. He spent 40 years uh, getting a sheepskin to the University of Egypt, and then he spent 40 years learning how to tend sheep. And then after age 80, he was ready to spend 40 years serving God. But look at the impact he's had on the world. Wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, the foundation of everything else. Uh, got the Ten Commandments from God, written with the finger of God. Uh, very few people uh, in the history of thought uh, have been greatly used of God who weren't educated. And practically nobody who refused to be educated uh, was greatly used of God. Yes, you find a D.L. Moody here uh, and a Peter there, but uh, who wrote half of the New Testament? The Apostle Paul. Uh, who Moses was trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Uh, we need people who were the great apologists. Augustine, Anselm, Aquinas, C.S. Lewis, all people highly uh, trained and educated. So God uh, sometimes uses people who don't have a formal training uh, but he doesn't use people who refuse to learn and refuse to take opportunities that they have. Mm -hmm. I know another question that people have about you know choosing seminaries or their different areas where they might study, um, aside from what age they might be at the time, but would be you know what are the pros and cons of an accredited versus a non-accredited degree and. What do you think are some of the considerations that people should have regarding one or the other? It just depends on what you're going to do with it. If it's for your own enrichment, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, study under the best. Uh, 
study under the uh, teachers who have written the books. Our faculty at Veritas Seminary have written over 200 books, probably closer to 300 uh, books. Uh, find the place where you can study under the people who have produced the best uh, literature and the best uh, books on the market uh, because they're the ones that you want to get it from and get it from directly. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder if I could ask a more personal question again, and that's along the lines of different experiences you've had in Christian ministry, teaching, and, and apologetics. And as you look back, what do you think are the most important maybe battles or struggles you've gone through in your life, whether it's personally or uh, maybe an apologetic perspective? Well, from an apologetic perspective, and I'll stick with, uh, with that, uh, the great battles that I've fought over the last uh, uh, 40 years or so, after I got my initial training, because I've been at it now for 60 years, but I went to school 20 years um, from high school, 1950 to 1970, got two bachelors, the equivalent of two masters, actually one, but the equivalent of another one and a PhD. Uh, and then I started to uh, really produce and, and to write, and I've written now 75 uh, books, uh, mostly related to uh, apologetic uh, topics. Uh, and I fought four major battles, and I don't regret a single one of them because they're all great fundamentals. The battle for God, who is God and what are his attributes, and we wrote a book by that title. Uh, the battle for creation, and we wrote probably four or five books on creation versus evolution. Uh, the battle for the Bible, uh, and I wrote four or five books on the inerrancy and inspiration uh, of the Bible. Uh, that's the, Those are battles worth fighting. The creation, uh, the battle for God, the battle for the uh, Bible. Uh, and uh, now we're we're engaged in in the battle for truth. I mean, it, truth is fundamental to everything. Thy word is truth. Uh, Jesus uh, said, "You shall know the truth. The truth will set you free." So, you, you pick your battles. Don't spend all your time uh, uh, debating how many angels can dance on the point of a needle or which end of the tribulation are we going to come out of. But spend your time on the great essentials to the Christian faith because in the Bible the main things are the plain things and the plain things are the main things find out what they are uh, learn uh, how to defend them and uh, spend your life doing it well, I think that's good advice what would your prediction be for where the battle lines will be drawn in the future well, I, I don't have the power to look into the future, and if I did, I wouldn't make any prophecies because they'd be afraid that somebody would reinstitute the uh, Mosaic Law and I'd be stoned because uh, they would, uh, I'm sure, contain false prophecies. Uh, but uh, you see, uh, you know, you see near view trends, you see things that are going, and the old problems are perennial. If you get trained in apologetics and apologetics that deals with naturalism and pluralism and relativism, you'll be well equipped to uh, come uh, to the contemporary world because it's just different variations on those themes uh, that they, they uh, bring up and different books from different angles, but uh, you'll be equipped. I think of myself as a fireman. I've got a fire truck, I've got the equipment, I know how to put out uh, fires, but I wait to see where the fires are. I don't go up and down the neighborhood squirting houses. You know, I wait till I see where the fire is before I go to the uh, fire. But once you have the truck and once you have the equipment uh, to uh, put out the fires, then you are ready to go. Well, I wonder also what sort of legacy that you'd want to leave for the next generation of, of Christian apologists. It's not my purpose in life. My purpose in life is to serve God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. As uh, Jonathan Edwards uh, said, and I'm paraphrasing, God wants to reach the heart, but he doesn't want to bypass the mind on the way to the heart. Uh, so my purpose is just to be faithful, to serve, to use the talents I have, uh, to fight the battles that uh, are at hand, uh, and to be able to say, uh, when I die, uh, 2 Corinthians or 2 Timothy chapter 4. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Mm -hmm. Well, I do want to ask you about Veritas, but one final question before that, 
And that's after doing apologetics for so many years, if you only had one thing that you'd want to pass along to future apologists, uh, one thing that you've learned that w would be uh, the only thing maybe you could stick in their hand for them to run with, what, what would that advice be? Get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the lid. Um, you got to uh, uh, put yourself to it. You have to uh, make an earnest effort to learn all that you can and to be the best you can and to feel that you choose so that you can give the best uh, defense for uh, the faith. I was not a, a, a genius. I am not a genius. I was an average person. In fact, when God got a hold of my life, I was below average because I couldn't read. I was a senior in high school. I had never read a book all the way through, made it all the way through high school without ever reading a book, and they found out I couldn't read when I was in 11th grade and put me in a remedial class, and God looked down and said, I want to make you a scholar. You know, and I say, ha, 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 ha. You know, you can see why Sarah laughed, uh, because it, that's funny. But he's got a lot of grace and a sense of humor, and uh, uh, 20 years later, he had me prepared for the uh, battle. All right, great. Well, finally, talk about uh, Veritas again and the opportunities that are available there. Uh, what is it? Where is it? Are there distance courses? How long does it take? You know, people want to pursue those sorts of things. Tell them about it. Veritas uh, Evangelical Seminary. Just go to Veritas Seminary, V-E-R-I-T-A-S, means truth, veritasseminary.com. Uh, and it's all there, right on the uh, web. The courses are outlined for you. You can get a master's degree. We have the best teachers, the least expensive uh, tuition, all on DVDs that you can uh, do from your own home, or you can come and take the classes on site in Southern California, Marietta, uh, California. Uh, but uh, it's the uh, best seminary to study apologetics in the country at the present time because there's no other seminary that has a better faculty, and the faculty is the seminary. We have top experts in each of the uh, fields, and uh, uh, Wynn Cordwin, who is a top in, in world religions, and Ron Rhodes is a top in, uh, guy in cults, and we have the top uh, uh, guys in theology, like Wayne uh, House, and the uh, top guy in cults, like Ron Rhodes, and I do philosophical apology and Gary Habermas, uh, historical apologetics, uh, and the top archaeologists, two, two of them in the, in the country, actually, are uh, on our faculty. It's, it's the greatest school in the country to study apologetics because it has the greatest faculty who've, wrote, who've written the greatest amount of books and the best uh, books on the topic. So we highly encourage you to go to... Uh, VeritasSeminary.com, uh, get an application, sign it, take them in your own home, come to California, uh, but uh, uh, get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the lid. Dr. Geisler, thanks so much for joining me today, and thanks so much for your labors in the kingdom. Uh, you're welcome. God bless you. I've been speaking with apologist Norman Geisler, distinguished professor of apologetics at Veritas Evangelical Seminary in Murrieta, California. Links to all of Dr. Geisler's resources can be found at today's blog post at Apologetics 315. If you've enjoyed this interview, please share it with a friend via Facebook or Twitter. And if you haven't yet become a friend of Apologetics 315 on Facebook, why not head over to Facebook.com slash Apologetics 315 today and become a fan. And you can follow on Twitter at Twitter.com Apologetics 315. And be sure to subscribe to these interviews in iTunes. Podcast episodes are released weekly, one day in advance of their blog posting. This is Brian Auten of Apologetics 315, and thanks for listening.